together January 24th, 1985. And then, as it's Christmas, I'd like to add my own dead greeting tonight. And it's from Isaiah 11, chap uh, chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And then, what the heck? No one's there to stop me, so I've never done this before, but I'll close with, "'Twas the night before Christmas. Happy birthday, Daddy. "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were all nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And on my honor, kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled down our brains for a long winter nap. When out of the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, to open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before a wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with asses and ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and his beard on, the, on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke had encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, and then turned with a jerk, and laying a finger on the side of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away all the, they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. To exist in the spirit only, and not to inhabit time or space, but to be out there in that vast eternity of darkness, it scares me witless sometimes. For I firmly believe that when one dies, the spirit goes on. But how will I, me, Julie, feel when I'm only a spirit? That's what scares me. I mean, I love the place where I live with all my heart and soul. I love a closet full of clothes, and I like the way those clothes feel around my neck right now. I'm reassured by the fact that I'm going to get hungry and eat lunch today. 
I like knowing, or more than that, I need to know that I will, it will get dark tonight, and that the day will end, and tomorrow will come, and be another day. I'm comforted by the concept of last month and next week. I need those steady and comforting state guidelines. But much, much more than that, I need other people to love and to be loved by, to talk to, to laugh with, to exchange ideas, to have as friends. So, to me, sometimes I ghoulishly imagine that death is to be alive spiritually, but to exist in a dark, claustrophobic void, in solitary confinement, forever and all eternity, like a great tragedy. And I absolutely panic and recoil with harm and in terror. A number of years ago, two of my daughters and I went through the Crystal Caves in North Dakota. They are one mile down, and their tunnels and caverns meander six miles under the Earth's surface. I suffer from slight claustrophobia, so I asked the attendant whether I should accompany the group. And she said, well, why don't you try it? And if you feel funny, tell us, and we will take you back up. But you must be sure and tell us right away, because once we get started, it will not be possibly possible to take you back again. Good compromise, I thought, and we descended in the elevator, down and down and down. Lights greeted us. Yeah, it is a sort of a, it was sort of an operatic grotto with fascinating stalactites and stalagmites, and I am relieved and confident that I can do it. I see a slightly concerned look on the face of one of my daughters, but no matter, I can handle it. So we proceed, single file, one mile below the Earth's surface. After a while, we get to a clearing, and our guide, a sadistic creature, announces that he wants us to experience real darkness, not the darkness of ordinary surface night but the total primordial blackness of subterranean depths, where not an ounce, not a glimmer of light will show. Total, absolute, consummate darkness. And he shuts off the light. Well, it is black, all right. Thick, total, consummate blackness. One does not know which way is up or down, right or left. I take a deep breath. I can manage. Or can I? What if the lights are broken when the light goes to, when the guide goes to put them on again? What if there is a power failure? What if we have to endure this for hours? One knows that one's eyes will not grow accustomed to this darkness. A wave of panic rises. Horizons press in on me. My hands get sweaty. I can't swallow. I take another breath. And nearing the breaking point, I lean over and grip the metal railing in front of me. And as I do, my hand brushes over the soft, silky hair of the small child standing in front of me. And it is the breath of life, like the whisper of an angel. There is another human being there, and she is accepting the darkness, and I am not alone. And then the light goes on, and we are back in the world, alive, grounded in time and space, eating clothes and food, with a tomorrow and a yesterday supporting us. But death, will it be like that cave? And then I reason, if I believe that I am going to exist beyond death and into eternity, then surely I must accept that I have existed for eons and centuries before my earthly birth. And if I got this far, why do I doubt that I can go farther? Have I experienced any pain or agony that I could not endure before this? No. God has been with me. God is with me now. And surely he will be with me in the future. And this ninth hour of the 24th day of January 1985 is simply a link in the normal passage of time between eternity past and eternity in the future. And it is our spirits, our perception, that makes it all real, makes it exist. And then I begin to get really excited. If God has given us all these delicious things on this earth, symphony, sunsets, friendship, apple pie, mountains, the sea, poetry, and most of all, love, then why do I suddenly think that he is going to abandon ship and leave us when we die? Surely that is a time when he will be closer than ever. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> on the contrary, the riches of the next life may be so staggeringly beautiful that if we knew what was in store for us, we might want to rush out and commit suicide, but then it wouldn't work. I recall waiting for a friend to come and pick me up last month to take me to an afternoon performance of Christmas Revels. As I stood there on the sidewalk in the sunshine, with the snow sparkling in the trees, knowing that I was soon to be assailed with song, music, and dance, I thought, Oh, thank you, God, for such a wonderful world. And I got the distinct answer back. Oh, you just wait. You haven't seen anything yet. 
And I think that is right. It is as Emily Dickinson says, who knows, in heaven, a completely new equation may be given. Imagine a new dimension, a new equation, a new existence where we will be able to see and perceive things that will utterly dazzle us. So I guess half of me, the human half that falters and doesn't quite believe and trust God, that half is in a planet. But the other half, who perceives and knows that is a God, that half stands on tiptoe and can hardly wait to see what is beyond. That half realizes that this life is just a learning ground, and that in death there is birth, the birth of something so dazzling that one's mortal senses just can't perceive it. So, students of Harvard, during this reading period, read, learn, soak up as much knowledge as you possibly can. Love and laugh and live life to the fullest. For all you experienced here, joy and pain alike, will enhance and hone all that is to come. And I will end with a bit of James Thurber. Let's slide down the rainbows of Thurber's perception when he invites us to figure out the distance between the horns of a dilemma, or between night and day, or A and Z. Or how far is up? Or how long does it take to get to the way? What becomes of gone? Where are you when you are sixes and sevens? And how much is do you need to make an R? Or how long does it take for the incoming tide to change to an outgoing one? What happens to a hole when it is filled? Or why does a child suddenly jump for joy? Or an icicle sparkle? Or a star twinkle? These things, and many, many more, shall we know when we are dead. Let us pray.